I have the pleasure to announce Juliana Tetris talk. As you know, she's part of the organizing team, and I look forward to mm -hmm. hearing her talk today. Juliana holds a master's degree in art history, theology, and Italian philology from the Free University Berlin, and a postgraduate diploma in post-war and war and contemporary art from Manchester University. Since 1995, Juliana has worked for major art museums and other educational institutions, as those of us who went uh, to Sarazenos in orbit, uh, you know this already, <laughs> because she took charge there. And she is currently working on a master's thesis in philosophy on the topic of vision and proprioception. And she will today talk about proprioception in visual art. So um, I'm actually taking up some points which Barbara Montero presented yesterday, which is quite nice. But first, I'm going to introduce um, the topic, and I'm starting right away. So it's um, generally accepted that perception is multisensory. However, the multisensory nature of vision has often been neglected or outright ignored. Nonetheless, the share of the beholder in experiences of, work of works of art has been pointed out early. In addition, art historians and artists since the end of the 19th century have also repeatedly referred to the felt bodily involvement in encounters with works of fine art and architecture. Robert Fisher coined the term Einfühlung, literally meaning feeling into for the bodily reactions that occur when viewing paintings and he thereby primarily referred to the viewer's bodily reactions to the formal language of a painting. In contrast, the later English translation empathy was very often used to refer to the human ability to empathize with the thoughts and feelings of other people. For the following, however, Fisher's original understanding of the concept will be of particular interest. Um, from the philosophical side, Merleau-Ponty empathically addressed the body at the central medium of all perception. Natural perception, as he puts it, opens an intersensory world. It happens with the whole body. In addition to the sense of sight, proprioception and kinesthetics do play a prominent role. Together, they describe a map of what could be called the I can. I have only to see something to know how to reach it and deal with it, even if I do not know how this happens in the nervous machine. Conversely, it's just as true that vision is attached to movement. And not only Merleau-Ponty, but also the psychologist Gibson emphasized the special unity of the motor and perceptual system. Gibson, who had a special interest in um, visual perception, described vision as a whole perceptual system and not simply as a sensory channel. One sees the environment not just with the eyes in the head on the shoulders of a body that gets about. We look at details with the eyes, but we also look around with the mobile head and we go and look with the mobile body. Finally, the philosopher Alva Noé points out that the role of sense of sight must not be understood according to the model of a photographic image of the world. He also stresses the point that perception is an active process, not a passive registration of sensory impressions. The close connection between the visual and motor systems was further confirmed by a major discovery in the 1990s. In the 1990s, mirror neural networks were discovered um, accidentally in experiments with monkeys first, but later confirmed also for humans. Could be shown that identical parts of the motor cortices fired during actual planning and execution, as well as mere observation of an action. And actually also just with imagining action, which is interesting for concept art. Thus representations for actions and movements of different persons are shared. Barbara Montero suggests that dancers literally experience the dance movements of others when they watch them, they proceed them as she suggests. Likewise, one could say that we literally feel the twisting of knees and legs when we watch someone tripping over a tree root. But first of all, what is understood by proprioception? I presuppose a narrow definition of the term, not including other bodily senses such as balance and interception, and I use it synonymously 
uh, with kinesthesia, as it's often done. In a nutshell, the proprioceptive sense provides information about the position, movement of the body and its parts. Proprioceptive sensing occurs primarily through cumulative neural input to the central nervous system through mechanoreceptors, which are detector mechanisms located in joints, muscles, ligaments, also skin. Central nervous system proprioceptive signals are integrated with input from other sensory systems, such as the vestibular and visual systems, and thereby contributing to automatic movement regulation and balance. Proprioception, uh, proprioception is often differentiated um, between proprioceptive information and proprioceptive awareness, as Gallagher and Bermudez do, for example. According to this view, proprioceptive in information is non-conscious, it contributes to movement, control, and direction, and it's often addressed as an essential component of the body schema, which, by the uh, definition of Richie Carutas, is the long-term, regularly updated, unconscious representation of the body's extension and posture. Um, on the other hand, we have proprioceptive awareness, which comes in two forms, um, in reflective or involutive form um, and in, pre, in a pre-reflective form, according to Gallagher. Proprioceptive awareness provides phenomenal access to proprioceptive perceptual content. The primary function of proprioception is often referred to as guiding action, and that is certainly true. However, proprioceptive feedback as part of the body schema is certainly also essential in keeping us in constant contact with our body, or in James' words, with the good old body always there, of course, also with interceptive input. But beyond that, proprioceptive feedback is obviously also quite essential that we can freeze movements, that we can stay in positions of rest. In this regard, it was very informative for me to know that a person suffering from deafferentation, that is, a person who from the neck downwards has lost his sense of proprioception and touch and who had almost completely lost contact with his body when his eyes were closed. For him at the, uh, at the beginning, it was initially almost impossible to stay in a one body position or to freeze a movement. So proprioceptive feedback then is apparently essential not only for actions and movements, but equally for positions of rest. And the background proprioceptive feedback is always with us or allowing the body to run on autopilot, so to say, for most of the time. And it rarely comes into the limelight of conscious attention. It's intuitive that we draw on our motor system when we imagine or plan actions and movements. And it's interesting that we also do so when we direct our attention to the movements and actions of others. Less self-evident and obvious, I should say, is that our motor systems can also be activated when viewing static images uh, of actions and biological movements. And indeed, it could be shown that when we look at images of frozen movements, our brain infers and neurally maps dynamic information about the evolution. But beyond that, you guess, the neural activity partially coincides with the neural activity that can be detected when we are actors ourselves, when we cut the bread ourselves, or when we kick the soccer bar ourselves. For the realm of the visual arts, it was neuroscientist Vittorio Galesi and art historian David Friedberg who first suggested um, simulation activity in contemplating paintings, sculptures. This is a nice, very nice painting by Rogia von der Weiden. They stressed the importance of mirroring processes in the viewing of works of visual art. And to this effect, looking at a picture of Eve grasping the apple can trigger motor neural processes overlapping with parts of those of planning and executing the grasping action ourselves. Most mirror neural activity is probably goal directed. Nevertheless, not only implicit goal oriented transitive actions are mirror, mirror neurally mapped. Also in transitive actions like lip licking, for example, or spreading the hand or lots of other simple movements and also communicative uh, actions are simulated. 
So there's much to suggest that the human mirror system not only captures the goal of an observed action, but apparently sometimes also the configuration and progression of an observed uh, movement. Finally, not only representations of active movements and actions are simulated by the motor system, but also the traces of movements and actions can trigger simulation processes. This could be shown for handwritten letters in contrast to printed letters, but also for scribbles and for the field of the visual arts. And you will find, you know, this um, photo, photography from yesterday from Barbara Montero, also for abstract expressionist works of art and explicitly also for the cuttings, the so-called concetti spaziali uh, of Lucio Fontana. So we have seen um, that actions and active movements, even if only re reconstructed by their traces, are often simulated. But what about passive movements? It seems hardly plausible to me that information about passive movements is available to the observer in a completely different way. Even without seeing them as agents, I'm in contact with these bodies. I intuitively know what it's like to be in a position like this. Even if, I'm, if, even if I have not been tortured or martyred myself, I do have at least a very vague idea what it means uh, to be quartered or nailed to the cross. Perhaps less dramatically, surely everybody knows how it feels when a physiotherapist or orthopedist um, is moving your limbs without your self-involvement. The mirror neuron research is mainly focused on the motor component of action simulation. And the somatosensory side um, has often been neglected. But what does that mean? Somatic sensations are those that are related to the perception of one's own body. Somatic sensations arise from the skin, from touch, pressure, pain or cold, from the muscles, tendons and joints. And all somatic sensations start with the excitation of highly specialized sensory receptors in the appropriate tissues, i.e. the skin, muscles and joints. They are connected through chains of neurons to the somatosensory areas of the brain's cerebral cortex, above all the primary and the secondary somatosensory cortices. Finally, somatic sensations are intimately associated with movement and resistant to movement. Could be shown that not only the motor cortices develop vicarious neural activity, but that the somatosensory cortices also have close functional connections to the mirror, mirror neuron system. In this sense, it's well established that the observation of passive touch, for example, activates neural areas in the observer that are equally excited in direct experiences of being touched, which seems very plausible when we look at, at, at Rodin's kiss, for example, but also at tortured bodies, and also perhaps less, less dramatically again, at this detail of a painting by Ribera, Isaac and Jacob. So Kaiser describes the extended findings of mirror neuron research as expanding the mirror. Instead of being a peculiar property of individual brain regions, mirroring is a rather general principle of brain function. Although we have specialized brain areas for viewing the world, namely our visual cortex, when it comes to feeling what goes on in the other people, we do not rely on a single specific specialized brain region. Instead, we seem to recruit those brain regions we would use to experience the same state, be it an action, emotion, or a sensation. So mirror activity is a widespread principle. And indeed, um, it could also be shown that emotional states of others uh, can be simulated. For strong emotions like disgust or fear, but also for pain, could be shown that regions of the anterior insula are equally engaged when we observe facial expressions of disgust, fear or pain on the one hand, or develop similar emotional states ourselves. For our purposes, however, of great interest is, as Gazzola and Kaisers put it, um, that movements and actions are not only motorically simulated, but sometimes also in a somatosensory way. Oh, sorry. Motor and somatosensory simulation are not separate processes, but seem to go hand in hand during action observation. It's likely, however, 
that the two forms of simulation may give us different complementary insights into the action of others. Motor simulation would be ideally suited for letting us feel the intentions of others and letting guess what they would do next. For intentions and programming the future is what our motor system is all about. Somatosensory simulation, on the other hand, would give us insights into what it would feel to act in that way. Is that object heavy to lift? Would it strain our body or feel good to do that? So from a phenomenal perspective, it's easy to understand that not only touch and pain are encoded in a somatosensory way uh, during, during observation, but that also movements and actions of others are processed accordingly. So I know exactly what it means to be in a position like this. Although I've never consciously thought about it before I was preparing this um, presentation, and although I'm not normally doing this exercise, I always intuitively knew that the abdominal muscles and those of the thighs are worked hard during that exercise, and I can really feel it when I look at that um, um, photograph. Similarly, the movements of any sports activity can be so familiar to the trained observer in terms of muscle and joint activity that she can practically predict the muscular consequences of awkward movements while observing them, analogously to instantly knowing what it means for the muscles and joints to stumble over a tree root. Finally, the header into the water of a diver is present to the engaged observer, not only with a spatial goal, the water, also not with regard to the sequence of movements, possibly also to be described as a goal, of course, double somersault, a whole twist, but also with regard to the necessary stretching and posture of the body and its parts during the course of the movement. Our brain sometimes obviously adds a, oh, sorry, adds a somatosensory dimension to the perception of third party actions. And in this regard, vicarious motor and somatosensory activity manifest different aspects of observed movements and actions and make them understandable accordingly. So we not only have the knowledge of the co-agent, I should say, but it's certainly also the knowledge of the co-proper Admittedly, the two are difficult to keep apart because they're probably closely linked. And it has been suggested that the coupling between action and proprioception is very primitive, already present in the simple living organisms. And also about Waterman, the deferent patient I was talking about, uh, it is reported that for him, at the beginning of his disease, due to the lack of proprioceptive feedback, it was not only impossible to move, but also not possible to only imagine the commands to perform the movements. Waterman did simply not know what to demand to make an arm move. Considering this, action planning seems to be closely linked to proprioception. And this might be why the sense of agency and proprioception are difficult to distinguish since functionally and phenomenally, they, are often, they often seem to coincide. And finally, that is, uh, that is why it might be helpful to look at passive movements. When we look at paintings like these, by Ribera, by the way, we are involved not only emotionally, but also in a somewhat a sensory way. Exper experimentally, it could be shown that watching an extreme stretching of the hands joints not only results in motor cortex activity, but also in the activity of the primary somatosensory cortex. Likewise, watching the stretching of other limbs, like here, certainly evokes simulation uh, activity. Nevertheless, despite this evidence, it still remains difficult to detect or isolate proprioceptive resonance. When we see tortured, martyred bodies, it's natural to conclude that our, and this time I mean global, comprehensive, empathic response is emotionally triggered. We immediately recognize terrible pain and fear of death. And so it seems obvious to attribute our empathic response to the perception of that pain and this violent emotion. For me, a very interesting question, however, is, could it possibly not be the other way around? Do we possibly mirror the dramatically winding, resistant or powerless postures of the body and thereby infer the emotional content. To answer this question, again, Barbara Montero uh, had this picture yesterday. 
may be helpful to turn to works in which bodies are shown in positions of rest, where we do not have any active or passive movement, we do not have a comparable dramatic event. Everybody knows um, Michelangelo's David, placed in front of the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence, the former um, center of secular power. And I'm asking myself how we can explain that this sovereignty, this calmness, this strength and self-confidence is so effectively expressed in this naked figure of the young man. Or how should we explain that an entire collective, that is the young Republic of Florence, could easily understand David as a claim to power and a sign of superiority, although we do not have a new, I, uh, we do have a new iconographic formula, and although the young man is not active in any way. And finally, how could it be that this naked figure uh, alone, without any insignia of power or trophies, could be read as a clear message of erection and strength? And in answering this question, I think we are brought back to the body and its language, to the upright posture uh, of the young man, to the interaction of muscle play and relaxation, which is presented in a perfect contrapposto. In a matter of seconds, even the contemporary viewer um, understands this nonchalant, casual demonstration of power. And Barbara Montero yesterday spoke of the appealing effortlessness of Renaissance art, which I find quite um, convincing. Now, we could argue that the cultural knowledge of David's heroism and fate, besides the spatial and temporal context of the figure, essentially determined this view. And I absolutely um, agree. There's no doubt that these components do play a significant role. They have a significant influence. However, the comparison with works of anonymous protagonists surely speaks for an essentially bodily reading. Um, Ron Murek's work, um, whom you perhaps um, had met before, Ron Murek's uh, work is famous for his hyper-realistic sculptures, most of them altered in space. Here, we have no reference at all to the social, spatial, or situational context of the scene. With Ron Murek, uh, the viewer is thrown back onto the, the often naked or almost naked bodies of the protagonist. The language of their bodies alone um, allows the viewer to read and understand the situation. And here again, it could still be argued, although I think less convincingly, we understand the emotional situation and accordingly read the bodily posture. However, what speaks against this hypothesis is that there are works in which we immediately understand the postures, the body language, even if we cannot decipher the sitter's emotional state. When the narrative context and emotional state of the sitter are hardly or not defined at all. Take, for example, Flandrin's young man. How is the young man at the seaside? Is he enjoying the sun? Is he possibly just resting after swimming? Or is he bored? Is he indulging his thoughts? Is he depressed? Is he lovesick? Or is he utterly happy? No clue, no idea. And this young man, by, uh, by again by Ron Muick, is he curious? Is he joyfully waiting for a gift? Or perhaps fearfully uh, waiting for punishment? Again, no idea. We do not know how these characters are doing emotionally. However, we know very well how it feels to be in bodily positions like this. And we certainly read and classify these percepts with our own memories and experiences. Finally, let's have a look at Van Dyck's crowning with thorns, which turns out to be very informative, I think. Here, the situation and emotional context are well described. Christ is surrounded by a crowd of human and animal aggressors who are threatening him. What would we expect? Pain, uh, not pain, yeah, pain, fear, excitement, nervousness, perhaps anger. And yet a split second glance at Christ's body alone is enough to understand that this is a patiently enduring, calm, one might even say relaxed Christ. 
um, obviously we can identify body postures in the flesh. We can read and thus understand them, even if the situational context clearly points into another direction. And we can probably identify and understand body postures as quickly as we identify and understand actions and active movements by means of mirror processes. We understand um, body postures semantically. That is, we know what it means or what it could mean to be in a uh, particular posture. The fact that we understand the posture of a sitter, however, does not mean, as shown by Flandrin and Murich, um, that we are directly able to infer the emotional constitution of the protagonist. So the identification of the posture on the one hand and of the emotion on the other does not necessarily seem to coincide, even though we usually seem to associate them very quickly. So in answering the questions why we read and understand other people's postures in a, in a matter of milliseconds, that is, why we know how it feels to be in a certain position, and secondly, why we very quickly associate body postures and emotions, research on the recognition of facial expressions might be helpful. Being in a certain posture feels a certain way, and what is true for the whole body is probably true also for just a small part of it, namely the face. When I wish to find out how wise, how stupid, how good, or how wicked is anyone, or what I thought at the moment, I fashion the expression of my face as accurately as possible in accordance with the expression of his and a way to see what thoughts or sentiments arise in my mind or heart as if to match or correspond with the expression. Uh, these words by Edgar Allan Poe correspond to what has been told about the painter Kokoschka. Kokoschka is said to have imitated the physiognomy of his models in order to better understand them and adequately capture them in his paintings. So following Kokoschka and Poe in a way, sensory motor simulation models for facial expression recognition have been presented. According to Wood, visual recognition of another person's facial, facial expression reliably activates the motor and somatosensory cortices alongside the visual cortices and thereby evidencing once again the important link between perception and sensory motor simulation. Observers of a facial expression of emotion automatically re recreated, covertly, partially, or completely. We refer to this as sensory motor simulation to highlight the fact that the perceptual process involves activity in somatosensory and motor systems largely overlapping with those that support the production of the same facial expression. Simulation sometimes, but not always, results in facial muscle activity in the perceiver called facial mimicry. So with, with Kokoschka and Poe, um, they deliberately um, did that to put themselves in, the, in their model shoes, one could say. According to Wood, sensory motor simulation of facial expression is normally automatic, and presumably non-conscious. Poe and Kokoschka, again, in contrast, consciously challenged these processes. It is modulated by the perceiver's social context and motivational state, and I would like to add, which is probably true for a lot of simula uh, simulation activity in general. Barbara Montero, um, therefore, is agreed when she writes, why is the Mona Lisa smile so captivating? Certainly, it's visually captivating, but I suggest it's also proprioceptively captivating. When we observe the smile, we feel what it's like to smile in that way. And if this is correct, there seems to be no reason to claim that visual experience is necessarily more fundamental than proprioceptive experiences. Rather, the visual and proprioceptive work, hand, uh, work, sorry, work hand in hand. Needless to say that sensory motor simulation models for facial recognition sometimes do play an important role in emotion theories, in simulation theories of emotion recognition. The idea in short is that coming to know what another person emotionally feels consists in sim simulating in the brain the motor plans and associated sensory representations that supposedly elicited the observed facial expression. Recently, an extension of the simulation model has been advocated for, and you're not surprised, not only facial expressions, but the expressions of the body as a whole 
are important expressive channels for providing cues to another person's emotional state. So both, according to this view, are regularly taking place and both should play a major role in emotion recognition. In addition to this, finally, body state simulation has been suggested. That is simulating changes in the observed person's internal bodily states, meaning changes in the autonomic nervous system and viscera, for example, in accelerated heartbeat um, of someone else and an idea which was prominently advanced by Antonio Damasio. But what finally is important here is that a crucial role in emotion recognition is proposed for both proprioceptive and interoceptive processes. Are we proprioceiving when we look at a work of art? Yes, there is much to suggest um, that we are co-proprioceiver. Mirroring processes have been empirically proved not only for the motor system, but also for the somatosensory system during action and movement observation. But what does that actually mean? Galesi describes the underlying simulation mechanisms of mirror processes as direct, automatic, non-predicative, and non-inferential. Mirror mechanisms grant direct access to the meaning of other people's behavior, where conscious introspective access is not necessarily required. Thus, we could say, we are proprioceiver behind the scenes. But that does not mean right away that we necessarily have to be aware of these processes, that we have phenomenal access to them. Mirror activity probably does not occur consciously for the most part. Nevertheless, it can cross the threshold of consciousness by the salience of a stimulus. You all know that. I can suddenly become aware of the pain of somebody else or can suddenly become aware of the muscle and joint experiences of another uh, person. So watching someone stumbling over a tree root, for example. Awareness of mirror activity obviously depends on the salience of a stimulus and probably on the degree of attention, which in turn depends on top-down process such as um, memory, knowledge, interest, motivation, emotional state, and so on. And it's well conceivable that mirror activity often feeds into pre-reflective awareness. Think of Newark of Flandrin and these young men. I think we are often phenomenally aware of how it feels to be in a particular position or posture or movement, but we do not have to be explicitly uh, aware of it. So now a question, is there an awareness beyond this non-conscious or pre-reflective givenness? Could we say that we can consciously, proprioceptively feel the body movements or actions of others, as Motero suggests, that as she writes, quote, in becoming aware of these representations, we in some sense proprioceive the dancers' movements? And I should say yes. Apart from the empirical evidence that the somatosensory cortex is more involved in action movement processing than probably our original thought, the, also the phenomenal perspective clearly points in this direction. When we watch or hear movements that are particularly familiar to us, that stand out or are meaningful in some way, and to which we also direct our attention, as it happens, by the way, paradigmatically in museums or stadiums or band theaters, then we often have the impression of formally undergoing them. And this experience is well comparable to other simulation experience. For example, it's in, in touch, it's, it's easy to understand. When I observe someone being touched, by, for example, by styrofoam, styrofoam is a material very unpleasant to many of us. Um, and then watching this um, being touched, can make me feel as if I myself have been touched with this uncomfortable material. So I think the as if is the essential part. What is phenomenally going on here can well be described um, as an as if experience. Watching someone else being touched or move in a specific way may consciously feel as if I myself have been touched um, or moved in a specific way. So functionally and phenomenally, conscious perceptions involving mirror processes can be aptly described this way. It may feel like for the dancer as if she has executed the movements herself, or it may feel like for the Rodin admirer 
as if she has been touched herself. And to this effect, dancers do not perceive the movements on stage in a way that they would actually fully feel their legs, arms and bodies moving. Instead, they perceive the movements on stage as if they were dancing themselves. And often enough, we describe such experiences with words like, I can literally feel the movement, or I can literally feel the touch. And this literally does not even correspond to a deception. The neural underpinnings, in a way, prove this statement right. Simulation mechanisms a very good explanation for why I can have a very lively feeling, a very lively idea of something, and yet at the same time know perfectly well that I'm not living it, actually, which sounds paradoxical, not experiencing it. Nearly needless to say that this is why literature, but lots of other entertainment, film, cinema, can be so successful. With it, visiting a museum or a dance theater, when I observe actions or the pictorial representations, which are of fundamental importance to me, encounters with art can become a genuine self-experience through this kind of reenactment. And in these moments, the boundaries between self and simulacrum can get neglected for once. And I think um, in this respect, our saying that good art can actually be touching is once again very instructive. So coming back one last time to Einfühlung or empathy, both uh, Laukon, two words um, of a Laukon. The automatic, often non-conscious processes play a significant role in our access to works of visual art. Direct access to the actions and movement of others is given without the need for explicit propositional attitudes. Galesi aptly speaks of intercorporeality. We track the intentions of others through our shared circuits. And it's already with these subliminal perceptual processes, or rather with predictions about them, that we are interpreting the world and its art. And this interpretation clearly precedes the business of the art critique or the art historian. But beyond Galesi, we probably not only detect the intentions of others in their movements and actions, we also often detect the accompanying bodily sensations. We not only understand the goal of an action, we also often understand the somatic intent and sensation associated with that action. So there's much to suggest that we often map the proprioceptive and presumably interoceptive facets of actions, movements, and postures. And this explains why many of us, while watching, immediately understand what's going on when people perform a certain gymnastic exercise or posture and why we can semantically classify postures in a flash without even any contextual information. However, I think that's important to note that simulation of salient actions, movements and postures does not automatically trigger empathy in an emotional sense, as it has sometimes been suggested. Numerous battle scenes in museums, for example, or even Warhol's disaster paintings, a good example, can leave us totally cold. Nonetheless, it's reasonable to assume that such pictures do trigger simulation processes, but that these are rather to be qualified as sensory motor einfühlung or sensory motor empathy. That instead of empathy, we should perhaps speak less misleadingly of bodily resonance in this context. Finally, with Galesi, it is to be presumed that, quote, the functional architecture of embodied simulation is the basis of our capacity to empathize with others. Empathy can be conceived of as the consequence of our natural tendency to experience interpersonal relations first and foremost at the implicit level of intercorporeality. So coming to a conclusion now. Vision is a multimodal operation that involves activation of the motor, the somatosensory, and the visceral sensory system. In researching the fundamentals and mechanisms of visual perception, the visual arts offer themselves as a very good uh, laboratory situation. When we look at works of art, we are physically, that is bodily, in much more direct contact with them that we might want to acknowledge. We encounter works of art with our whole body and certainly not only with our eyes. 
we encounter works of art uh, with the exteroceptive senses, but also presumably quite decisively with the so-called bodily senses, with proprioception and interception. And in addition, we obviously encounter works of art with our knowledge of the world, which we have acquired through our bodies. So the riddle of the liveliness of pictures can well be explained with reference to simulation mechanisms. In pictures and sculptures, frozen actions and movements are not materially reproduced, no, the viewer often reenacts the action or movement. The beholder's share then is not only in the transformation of a two-dimensional into a three-dimensional image, also not in top-down processing with memory and knowledge. No, the beholder's share is also given by his property as a co-agent, as a co-proper and as co-toucher. And in this sense, the liveliness of the image is rooted in the bodily nature of the beholder. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juliana. We now have till quarter past for questions and comments. I'm giving the floor to Marcus here. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Juliana. I, I, I don't have a question because, first of all, everything was so clearly um, set out. And uh, also, it is um, uh, amazingly informative um, for uh for the project um and um uh, shows us uh very much that um in in visual art a lot of proprioception is is going on so i, I really i don't i don't have a i, I really don't have a, a a question because everything is so clear one thing would would be i i said that we can cr cross categorize of course works of of art they can be many things they can be visual arts and um auditory arts and proprioceptive arts at the at the same time and all the examples you have given and the pictures you have shown would um by my definition um of course be visual arts uh, art uh, but also proprioceptive art but i i i i would still think or it, it 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 makes me realize that although cross although cross uh categorizations are possible or multiple categorizations are possible there is somehow the the dominant or the direct um um perception uh is still the one by which we tend to categorize so although um, it is perfectly clear from, from what you have said and argued that Laokoon, say, is a proprioceptive artwork, we would still say um, it's pre predominantly visual. We would, we would not, we would not, uh, our first reaction, I guess, wouldn't be to say, oh, wow, here's another proprioceptive artwork. <laughs> but it, it would be rather, or we would maybe rather um, um, uh, categorize it not by the, the the sense perception, but by um, by saying that it's it, it is a, a sculpture. So all I'm saying is, <laughs> um, although definitely um, almost every visual art involves proprioception, it's only secondarily so that we would classify it as as such. Uh, but it is very important to highlight the proprioceptive aspects of it, um, which uh, is, 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 is very much part and essential of the, of the artwork. Sorry, that was just a, um, um, a, a commentary, not, not really a question. I can um, also uh, agree with, with Marcus. There's not much to say. It was a really good talk. Um, just, just two points which um, kind of go further. Um, you differentiated between proprioceptive information and proprioceptive focus. And I thought, uh, especially in the context of visual arts, um, if we shift from this proprioceptive information to proprioceptive focus, do we therefore also take something away from the visual art? We, we cannot shift from proprioceptive information to proprioceptive awareness, because as far as I understand it, we do not have access to proprioceptive information. Something in the 
different neural pathways. The, the pathway for the for the um, awareness of, of proprioceptive um, input and the other one. And so we don't have any access as far, as far as I understood that not being a neuroscientist, but we do not have access to proprioceptive information it's really running behind the scenes. Does that explain? Yes, yeah, that at least uh, sums up, up that position. And um, then you wanted to uh, see proprioception in the narrow sense. So you take away the balance and you um, just reduce it to positionality and movement. And I thought, given this narrow sense, um, then where would be the kind of difference between um, the artwork of the plank, which we, we looked at, and between uh, Zaratzebus net? Because if we just see them hypothetically as artworks that try to, for example, give the maybe illusion or just feeling of, for example, being high up and be um, and um, giving rise to the action of stepping over the edge, kind of, then there wouldn't be much of a difference between those two with the narrow sense. Yeah, I, I mean, I was discussing with members of the workshop here. I thought that, for example, in, in, um, in orbit, Saraceno, not the proprioceptive sense in a narrow sense is involved so much, or the pleasure does not come from the proprioceptive sense in a narrow sense, but perhaps much more from the sense of balance, because what is really nice in, in um, Zarzeno's work is try to, to find your way, your, your movement through the uh, installation. So um, this for um, Zarzeno, I haven't experienced the plank. I mean, is the plank wobbly? Um, does it, not really. So, um, I guess if we were to imagine Tarazzino's net um, like directly over the ground, it would be less of an experience. It, uh, it's just the, what I would yeah. imagine, like just like half of a meter off the ground, then you wouldn't get this uh, the same value as you would. So then again, you would get the proprioceptive experience, which adds so much to it by your visual. Uh, exactly. Yeah. System. Yeah. Absolutely. And then and, there wouldn't be a difference. Yeah, and and. Gibson, I think it was Gibson who speaks of visual um, proprioception. When we, when we um, consciously proprioceive, very often the visual element comes in and it, it definitely generates lots of illusions as well. Yeah. Um, because, as I said, two different pathways. And um, so um, the, um, the conscious proprioception very often comes together with vision. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I have the chance to comment too. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I do only have a comment, not a question, uh, or just something that sprang to my mind uh, during your talk. And you were building on, um, first of all, the aspect of mirror neurons for emotions, but then also, also with the, the caveat that those might not be conscious, but we do have emotional responses to pictures. But one thought that I had while you were talking about was that often it's not that we have the emotion that is depicted in a picture, but we have an opposite um, emotion. So sometimes if you have like an aggressive face shown and you understand, okay, that's aggression, but you feel maybe fear or mm -hmm. maybe not fear, maybe disgust because you're like, why is this person so raging? Yeah. And I was wondering whether... That is, I mean, you're already nodding, so I think you already have something to say to that, but I was wondering whether maybe, so I'm turning it into a question now, yeah. um, whether maybe this differences in, or may, maybe we call it then disrepresentation uh, could happen with the bodily sensations too. I, I'm not a neuroscientist, but um, all I, I can underst I understand is that um, the one thing, that, that's why I thought it's a very important point to to, to separate sensory motor and empathy from emotional empathy. And that's why it was for me such an important point to make that clear that the two don't go together because it's exactly what you say. It happens when you look at paintings, there might be someone crying 
um, and uh, being really sad, but it's not touching you. It's not, um, um, I mean, you sensory motorically, are, do, you do simulate the process, but it's not emotionally uh, triggering um, any responses in you. Or a different response even. Or, or different responses, exactly. And um, I'm not, I mean, emotions, now we're coming to James, and James has been um, quoted yesterday um, quite often. Um, emotions probably, I mean, I think that's very plausible, they, um, they um, do have lots, lot, they have a lot to do with your interoceptive um, reaction. So your interoceptive reaction to a painting can decisively um, 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 influ influence how you um, em emotion. Perhaps the the um, interoceptive is the emotion. I'm not hundred percent sure, but the interoceptive um, um, reaction to a painting will um, um, will definitely trigger your um, or will take part in triggering your emotional. Um, response to the painting, which is something different than the sensory motor um, simulation of the person's um, postures, which are depicted. Mm -hmm. did, did they get it? Did you? I, I think it was helpful okay. for me. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yeah. We do still have time for further questions. Uh, however, in the room, I don't see anyone indicating any, and I will give the chat another moment. Corinna, would you like to say out loud? You can just comment. You don't have to have a question. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to share this paper where they exactly try to disentangle the um, motor form of embodiment or motor simulation and then the emotional simulation. Um, there's also more. I think they cite, um, cite other studies that try to disentangle these two aspects. Um, it's quite a recent paper from 2021. Yeah. Okay, I, I think that will be fun to check out. Okay. Okay, well, if there are no further questions, I would say let's thank our speaker again, and we will reconvene at uh, 1230 with Corinna's talk. <laughs>